I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Gold Medal Minute Takeover. This one's my podcast, and today we are extraordinarily lucky. We have a superstar of swimming. Not just a superstar, this, this athlete's career burned white hot. She is, she was the most decorated swimmer of the 1992 Olympic Games. The first woman to qualify for four individual events since Shirley Babishoff in 1976. Today we have Summer Sanders. <laughs> Looking for the latest swim technology from the fastest brands? Find the right suit for you with Swim Outlet's 2020 Tech Suit Review. Available now at swimoutlet.com slash blog. Mel, okay, the only thing I think of, I'm watching you and your setup. Your setup is so much better than my setup with your headphones and your microphone. And here I am petting my puppy dog, sitting in my outside, but I'm watching you and I'm thinking to myself, look at how far we have come, buddy from running through hotel lobbies and hallways and shaving cream fights at pan packs. You know, that's what's so awesome about our sport. Number one, that we have such great camaraderie, but number two, shaving cream is a necessity in our sport, which I think just makes for awesome memories. I think that I think that you need shaving cream endorsement. You need to be a shaving cream <laughs> ambassador. I just, just my two cents. I'm just I'm just yeah. throwing it out there. You're, yeah, I think no, you're still. Are you, are you still? Are you still with? Can I say this on? Can we say this? Can we say you're still with CAA? Yeah, yeah. yeah I've you're been still with CAA. With, I've I've been with my agent, and this is actually an interesting subject for swimmers who might consider turning pro. I have been with my agent. He's younger than I am. Um, I've been with him for over 20 years. I've followed him from four different uh, agencies. It was like athletes and artists and then SFX and then he started his own and now he's at CAA. So yeah, I'm with CAA, but most importantly, I'm with Lil Taub, who we've just kind of grown up in, in this business together. Yeah, very professional. We, you know, we've interfaced with him and he's, he's, uh, yeah. he's a cut above your normal representation, but it's for people out there who don't understand the entertainment industry or they're not uh, familiar. CAA is uh, a storied agency, uh, mostly in entertainment. They were the boutique. If you know the name Mike Ovitz, Mike Ovitz turned it into a powerhouse. But uh, it, when I heard that you were with CAA, I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> Total standards with CAA. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm, so, a teeny, I'm a teeny tiny, tiny player in CAA, but okay. I'm proud of it. So before you came on, we we're like wondering, like you, because it took a minute or two for you to come on. You were late a minute or two. And yeah. I was talking to Coleman. I'm like, she's out, she's out running. She's going to come on. She's in it. And it's just going to be like, hey, what's happening? How you doing? Did you just have a run? Um, I did not run today, but I did run from my car. So to be honest with you, these hounds, I have two doggies and they were in the back of my car. I just dropped my daughter at softball and my neighbors give them treats. And so they literally hang out in the corner of my backyard, just waiting to hear something like a, a peep from my neighbor so that they can bark and get treats. So they bolted from the back of my car to my neighbor's house. So I was running over there to go find them and corral them to come back. But my day, Mel, has been really about kind of running around my house. I did exercise though. I did. I know where you're going with this. I did exercise. And most importantly, I showered afterwards. So bonus, bonus for I, I was, you're just, you know, it's, here's the thing. A, a lot of people know you and are, have become Summer Sanders fans because if you're 25 plus years on television. <laughs> and I mean, you, but you're, you're just, and like I, you know, I'm, I'm a peer. So I, you know, I watched this evolve mm -hmm. and, but it's, uh, what was it? Figured out on Nickelodeon. Is that it? Was Figure that Figured out. That yeah, was that. Would, that's the show that made you famous. I mean, kids went bananas for you. Kids and, went bananas, and it was like the best show and the best. It was like the best time to be working for Nickelodeon. I mean, you walk through their offices at fifteen fifteen Broadway, and I know you know that area so well. But it was Viacom, still is Viacom. But you walk through. I mean, it was like MTV on one side, so it was like all the cool Total Request Live on one side. And on the other side was Nickelodeon and you walk through it. It's like, everything's written in chalk. There are toys everywhere. It was as if you were just walking into your biggest playroom 
Um, but like a, an intellectual, intellectual and creative playroom where they were just studying kids. And they, it was, so for me, I really felt truly honored that I got to talk to that group of kids that loved Nickelodeon the way they did. And now those awesome kids are in their thirties, you know, mid thirties. And they are like, some of them Mel are running production companies. Like I can't tell you several years ago, I'd walk in for meetings and these heads of these production companies in LA, I could see their faces turn into their 12 year old self. And I'm like, this, this is why I love the show because those kids, there was, there weren't a ton of, of, uh, stations. There weren't a ton of networks out there. It was Nickelodeon ruled the airwaves for kids. And now, you know, you've got Netflix and YouTube and, and Amazon prime. It's like, you've got so many options for kids viewing, but back then it was Nickelodeon and, and it was great. So I felt very honored. Well, let's, let's, um, Let's bring it back to some narratives and let's, let's, let's go back in time. This is what I want to cover. I, I, and I, and I'll, I'll start it in a, in a very specific way because I want, to, I want to give people a first-person account of, of you as somebody who competed with you and as someone who's seen you. You're, you're all grown up now, two kids, married to a three-time. Uh, you, you went outside to swim and you married a winter Olympian. You married a real <laughs> athlete. Thanks. And it's, but, it's a, but, I, so, but this is what I like to cover today. I'd like to cover your career. Okay. And then I like I like to cover some some TV and and I'd like to ha- I'd like to know it if you could talk a little bit about you know elites and their segue into post swimming life yeah and and I, and I'd like to finish with it you know if any advice you have for swim parents we got a lot of swim parents out there that listen mm-hmm. so I just, I want to start here the okay. uh, when I think of summer Sanders um, I think of this that the, this. I, I think of this person that everyone thinks is, you know, you're glamorous from the years of television, but I know that you're very earthy and you're very, you know, you're very, uh, you, you, your humanity comes through, mm-hmm. you know how to connect. And which is why I'm like, she's going to come on from after having a run and be like, Hey, what's up? How you doing? But when I think of you, I think of that. And I see that little girl uh-huh. and, uh, and who I didn't think would be so fierce and so that's my image of you in my head when I think of you as a swimmer. When I think of you as an adult, I think of one moment where we were in an intimate setting with a lot of VIPs from in the mm-hmm. swimming community. And it was, a, it was a donor situation. It was about raising money for Learn to Swim. And I've heard the speeches from a lot of our Olympic peers. And no offense to our Olympic peers, but I've yeah. never cried in a speech. Sorry, Rowdy, never made me cry. <laughs> you spoke in an event. And I was just like, uh, I don't know where that came from, but it connected in such an authentic way. I wish I could recreate it right now. I wish I could have downloaded it, copied it. It was just, but it's, it, you can't because it, it, I think it was, you know, it's like your soul came through, but uh, when I, that's, that's really who you are. Yeah. And you're I, really sweet. I remember that. I remember and I think it, maybe it was because, and I never really write my speeches down, especially certainly when I'm talking about swimming to swimming people. It's like I'm talking with them, you know, and I was certainly talking with you as opposed to at you. Um, and I'm sure it, it touched you because it was, I, I'm sure I was talking about your journey as well. Um, that's what's so cool about us 90s and 80s kids in this sport. We, we all shared the same journey. It wasn't complicated. <laughs> it really wasn't, you know. Um, so yeah, I, and, and you get me, you know, you knew me when I was younger. I'm still wearing flip flops. I sometimes forget my shoes when I'm needing to go to the grocery store as an adult. I did that exact same thing when I was in high school. No, well, um, there was a, there was a period of time where I'm like, she doesn't have shoes or flip flops. <laughs> she has a V neck t-shirt and those little nylon shorts. And yeah. no shoes. Why, why won't someone give her shoes? I swear that's like you traveled. Every, I'd see you to swim meet, travel for the national team, and uh, flip that flops. was your that was your go to outfit. Yeah, it it's a staple. I I put my flip flops in any bag, even in the winter time here. I, they are in my swimsuit and a pair of flip flops, no matter where I'm going. But I think what's interesting, um, the way you did describe me, Mel, is, and I think it's important for kids right now to understand this too is that I, I think you can be kind and competitive at the same time. I think that, because I did give off this air and it would drive my, oops, sorry, oops, 
Are you there? So My unprofessional. Mom. Can't believe you lost video. 25 My years mom. of television, 25 years of TV. Way to go, Summer. My <laughs> mom is calling. She's totally going to call again, too. I'm going to have to text her. Okay. Why don't but you text your mom? You text her, say, Mom, okay. I'm talking to Melvin. Hold on. I don't want to hang up on you, so hold on. I'm just going to tell her. I'll call you right back. She's, she's uh, Summer Sanders. You, is, is right? texting her mother. Okay. Summer's so, long, you know me long enough to call me Melvin. <laughs> okay. Really side, a quick sidebar about my mom. My mom and I have talked on FaceTime every day since quarantine at 5 p.m. No. Um, so we're like into day 80 or something cause she has a lung condition and she cannot go outside and really be with a lot of people. So we sit there and we FaceTime and we're her connection in a lot of ways. So that's my mama. Okay. But I did want to say it is possible to be kind and competitive at the same time. And you did describe the way I was when I was younger and the way I am in large part now, I think I've shifted just slightly in my, my wise old years, but it would drive my coaches crazy because they always assumed because I was laughing and having fun that I wasn't taking it seriously. And they quickly learned that once I stepped on that blocks, I mean, it really would take until I was on the blocks that all of a sudden the switch flipped and I became uber competitive. But then as soon as I got out of the pool, I just sort of left that there and I turned into that person. Or if, if we were doing a tough set and I'm laughing with my friends and Richard Quick, my coach from at Stanford, if he thought I wasn't giving it my all, he would see it change in a second as I pushed off for that set. So, so everybody's different, but I just, just a reminder that you don't have to be fierce all the time. You can be no, kind I'm, and competitive all in the same human being. So, Coming from Summer yeah. Sanders, that's wisdom. There you go. It's wisdom. So let's go back. I, you know, I, I, you take it for granted when you're living through it, but I didn't know that you were 15 in 1988 when you got third in the 400 IM. I didn't know that you were that so young. What was that experience like for you? Did, did you know that you were in the hunt to make the team, or was it a surprise? Where, Walk me through it. Paint a picture. Yeah, it was such a surprise. It was a beautiful surprise. It's like, it's that awesome meet where you're so nervous because it's Olympic trials and you can cut the tension with a, with a knife or a pair of scissors. You can feel the air is heavy on the pool deck with, with the worry and the angst of every swimmer. Um, but I walked in and Mike Hastings, my coach, um, who just passed away. Did you know that Mike Hastings passed away? Okay. Um, so Hastings... Uh, you know, he knew me very well. And he said, no, 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 you're just going to use this meat for experience. Just go have fun. You're not going to make it basically just go out there, enjoy it, surprise yourself. And I did. So it was totally a surprise. Um, and it was totally a surprise that I was winning by a full body length with about 30 meters to go in the 200 IM. And rightfully so, and I really authentically say that, rightfully so, I touched third and I did not make the team. I had no business making an Olympic team at age 15. The only bummer was, is that because I got third, Mike, Mike had said, I will quit smoking if you get second. And I got third. So he did not quit smoking, which I was quite bummed about that. But, you know, can only do so much, Mel. I was 15. It was the 1980s when, when, when swim coaches smoked. <laughs> I know, isn't it crazy? It's, uh, it, so here's the thing. What, what, was, what was the turning point for you between 88 and, and 92? Well, it was like, okay, there's, you know, everybody has that moment where they're like, ooh, I better latch on. This is going to be something that's amazing, and I've that got moment. this. That was that missing, moment. That was it. Missing the Olympic team because I was right next to Mary Waite, Mary Waite was like spitting in my lane before the race, you know? I mean, she was fierce. It's like, forget about it. You have such a sweet Southern voice, but not uh when you step on that block. So uh, I was competing against her and I forget who, I mean, Whitney Hedgepeth, obviously in lane eight was the other person to qualify for the Olympics, but I didn't think I belonged there. And then in my little Lycra suit, I think I weighed like 92 pounds um, I touched that wall and I saw third. I'd bettered my time by three seconds. 
I was in lane number three. Oh, you weren't wearing a paper suit? No. I mean, they had just come out. But, you know, Mel, I was like, these are so tiny. I don't know. So I just stuck with my Lycra suit, my giant goggles. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you wear bug eye goggles? Dude, I did. And then, no. I, and then I moved to Compi goggles. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. So, so at that moment, that's when I knew. And I, I tell people often, a lot of times people have the dream of being an Olympian. And that's when it became a goal. That's when I was like, oh, I can do this if I try hard. And so it wasn't perfect. I mean, I went home and, uh, you know, I hurt my shoulder about 11 months before the 92 Olympics. Um, but I had this kind of seamless transition in, from Mike Hastings to Richard Quick, which I'm forever grateful that they were just so good to each other and allowed me a little freedom, you know, to experience both coaches at the same time. Uh, and then four years later, I had the fire. <laughs> you had the fire. Well, it's not that simple. There's more story <laughs> there than that. I was on deck two. I saw it. It was, um, I remember you had a, you had a pretty slam bang 1991, 1991 world championships. You did. Yeah. And going in 92, um, I expected you to, to, to win all of your individual events. I was like, she's just got it and it's going to happen. And you, you got a bronze, you got a silver, nothing wrong with getting a bronze and a silver, but I was waiting for that individual goal. And I remember it being, it felt like every, you know, everyone loved you so much and everyone felt your, you know, you were such a kind person. Everyone wanted you to have your gold medal. And it was, a, I, I remember feeling like this collective exhale when you won. It's like, oh, she won. And I remember seeing your face. It's uh. It's it, it, it's special. Did did you did you struggle? What was that journey like in '92? You know, because exhausting. I mean, I, it's it's my experience. You know, I'm I'm experiencing, but that's not your experience. You tell me. Yeah, it was exhausting. I mean, if I had to put one word on, uh, what is it? Eight days of competition, or seven days of competition? Exhausting. You know, because not only, I mean, listen, we can sit here and talk around it, but there were a lot of speculation with some of the swimmers that I was competing against. And Chinese. to this day, okay. yeah, to this day, I have a lot of uh, now executives and, and high coaches in the swimming community that are like, you deserved golds in all your races. That's true. I got so, in an argument with somebody about that. I'm like, she should have gold medals, more gold medals. And, and yes, that's, that is absolutely correct. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. And um, so, but I'm, at that time, I actually said to myself, I could, I could sort of understand their situation in needing that. And I, so I, I would, I would pump myself up for every single race and then I would fall just a little bit short of that gold. And I was really in my heart. Okay. With it now. I really was, I was like, I didn't expect to win gold. I, I wish I had, but I was pretty, like I'd broken my hero, uh, Tracy Hawkins American records. So that was a big deal for me. But as I inched along, especially after that 200 IM, which is by far my favorite competition from that Olympic Games, because I felt like I was really tough to the very end. Um, and Lynn Lee, who won, broke the world record, and I then broke Tracy Cockin's American record. Um, I, after that, I just remember crying in Richard's arms because I was just exhausted in psyching myself up for the next go. You know, so mentally, physically, I was, I was tired, but I wasn't exhausted mentally. I was, I was destroyed. I was just, so I can't imagine trying to accomplish what these swimmers and athletes accomplish and have social media and the expectations, just, you know, that weight on your shoulders, if you allow that to happen. So, and I'm a very feeling person. So of course, if, you know, I felt it from all of you guys, like I knew you wanted it for me so badly. And I wanted it for myself. So, you know, it comes down to the very dramatic, very last day, my last race and uh, my best race. And I swam it so imperfectly and unlike I ever swam that race before. Um, but Richard would tell the story all the time about how when you want something badly enough and you just don't give up and you go back to your stroke, and somehow in that last 25 meters, 
all I kept thinking was that I can, I can get my arms out of the water. Just do your whole stroke. Just get your arms all the way out of the water. You know, sometimes when you try harder, you turn into that cartoon character and you're just spinning your wheels. So I just really tried to lengthen, lengthen and be strong, lengthen and be strong. And then I, somehow I came from behind and touched the wall first. And it's never happened in my life. So it happened at the best time possible. It was, I, I just remember the look on your face. I just remember the look on your face. It, it looked like relief. Everyone felt the relief. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, when, when I think about your career, and I think it's, when I sit at the top of the show, I'm like, white hot star, right? Aww. And because it was quick. It was super quick. You know, if you were, if you were professional today, you'd be going to three Olympics. You would right. be going maybe maybe four probably you know with with your talent you you would be swimming a long time you'd have a lot of shots at it and um, you really segued quickly into another career mm-hmm. and uh, you went you went to television it was fast you were you were working in television you were still I thought that you had retired but it's like it 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 I, were you still competing or were you like you hadn't officially retired. I retired and then I uh, went straight into working in television and then came that I did that tiny comeback for 10 months, um, which was, which was brilliant. It was awesome. I, uh, because it made me in the end, I, I think I just put the making the Olympic team as the goal because that's what you do if you've already been an Olympian and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't the goal if I can get kind of philosophical here, it was really a moment to appreciate what I had done in 92, which I never allowed myself to do. So it was so good. Whoa, 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 whoa. You never allowed yourself to enjoy it. It, Please, please get inside of that. Yeah. So, you know, I was 19. I was a Stanford student. There was always what's next. Sorry, my dog is nudging me. Um, There was always the what's next. Right. So I, okay, check that off the list. I've done Barcelona and I've won my gold medal. And now I'm going to go back to Stanford and I'm going to do this and then I'll do this. And then there's Atlanta, right? Like you just, that's the way, it's the way I was. I mean, if we're hyper scheduled, that's to be honest, you just looked to the next thing. So I really didn't allow myself to enjoy, but I, but I think maybe what you're shocked about is I enjoyed, I enjoyed the win and I enjoyed that moment, I think as much as I possibly could with all the chaos that happens afterwards. But what I didn't get a chance to fully digest and enjoy were my teammates and that how special that experience was, right? So to just, just sit there and to take it all in and really feel all the love from you guys that wanted me to do well, to take it in. So when I didn't make the team, that's when I looked back on that moment and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm so lucky. Like I'm the luckiest girl ever to have had those amazing teammates, such a small group of women that we were all so, we were so cohesive and we really did cheer for each other with our whole hearts. Um, so it was, it was special. So that's what I mean about enjoying it. Dude, this is, I, 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 this is a stupid question. It just popped into my head. Did Richard Quick try to suck you into that 2000 all-star crew that he had training? So come <laughs> no. on, come on back, Summer. You got you to you come back. I, I've got everybody on deck now. No, because you, know, that, you have to understand, at that time, I was living in New York. I, was, I had my Nickelodeon show. I was working for the NBA full-time. Yeah. So I would pepper in my Nickelodeon. So I was like, I knew what I wanted to do. And I was so, I was so done with swimming. At the, I loved my swimming career and... And all of that, but I knew I wanted to be in television. You know, you knew you wanted to do what you're doing now for just as long as I knew I wanted to be in television. So I was like thrilled. I mean, I won my Olympic medal and then I went and did that interview with NBC. And the first thing I asked them for was, can I please have four tickets to the Dream Team gold medal final? Because you know, I was like, Michael Jordan was my, that was my person. So we went to that final and that's when I saw Ahmad Rashad in the stands. And to be honest with you, my girlfriends were like, I don't know who that is. And I was like, Ahmad Rashad, he hosts inside stuff and I am going to go say hello to him. So that's when I introduced myself to Ahmad and then fast forward six years and I became co-host of inside stuff. Did you do that for eight seasons? 
I did it for 10 years. 10 years. Excuse me. Wow. Yeah, no, but, but eight seasons where it was fully on four seasons on NBC, four seasons on ABC, and then two seasons when it was on NBA TV. Wow. No, it's it, your career started. But what, what's fascinating to me was that you, you were so young. Like you, <laughs> like, I, I can't get over the fact that you would have, if, if, the, if Summer Sanders were competing today, she'd be going to Olympics after Olympics. But you're, you're, you, you burned bright, hot, it ended, and boom, you were into television. Yeah. And in what your TV career was off, it's like, what is Summer Sanders doing next? Because you were always doing something. You didn't make the, the, the Olympic team in 96, but you, you immediately touched down in Atlanta with Rowdy. And uh, that was Rowdy's really first turn in the chair. He did work in 92, but that was his first turn in the chair. And he's now done it for, what, seven or eight Olympics. Huh? Um, when you watch him, do you think, Rowdy, you did that wrong? I, I could have done that better. Does that go, yeah. To be honest with us, do you, does that go through no. your head? No. 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 <laughs> Not at all. He's so good at what he does. I love him in that chair. I love him there. I can't imagine swimming without Rowdy Gaines. I just can't. So hopefully he's in it forever. He's a sweetheart. He's, yeah. uh, but it's, well, hey, you know, you, we, you've, got, you've got the first person account. What was that like? Because it, it, he did 92, but that was the first in 96. Um, yeah. You were probably, you were, you were an analyst at the time. Being an analyst is hard. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's, hard. It's, you know, because you're, it's like a, um, a dance yeah. with your, with your, uh, play by play. So, uh, and Dan Hicks is the best dance partner, but you know, when you have a shorter event, you got to get your stories out quick and you got to make them good enough to be worthy of, you know, billions, what are we talking? Millions and millions of people watching. Um, and, and it was hard, uh, and you're right, Mel, I literally, I didn't make the Olympic team. So we're in Indianapolis and I, I leave the warm down pool and NBC says, would you like to do commentary at the 96 games? I mean, I hadn't even changed into my clothes yet. So they, like, swoop, yeah. they swoop me up and they bring me to the, um, the Olympic seminar. And oh. so I'm sitting there telling all my tales of all the inside stuff you know, authentically, because I don't know any other way to do it except for just to be me in my V-neck and, and <laughs> my flip-flops. And uh, yeah, and that was my first, and I loved it. I was, I was not perfect. I wasn't even close to perfect. I screamed into my microphone, um, but I did love it. I loved, uh, you know, talking about my sport and coming straight off of, of knowing all of these awesome athletes. It was, you know, true honor to represent swimming. So over your 25 years in TV, what is, what, 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 what is a joy? What's, 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 what was like, this is my happy place. This is, which is where I really, this is what any I Any live event, any live event, the taped stuff. I just, I don't, I don't like, and that's, that's something that I think our society and culture is, um, is enjoying much more also, right. Especially during coronavirus, right. You don't need, I haven't worn makeup in three, four months, you know, not that I ever wore a ton of it, but, um, now you can be imperfect. You can be super imperfect and people appreciate it. <laughs> people appreciate it. Um, but I like that raw, that's the closest I can get to, uh, me being on the blocks competing is live television or a live event. So it was never lost on me. And Olympic Games, I still I loved working every single Olympic Games, but I also loved uh, one in particular was being on the field at Yankee Stadium during the World Series, and I was working for Extra at that time. But I was interviewing Billy Crystal and Robin Williams, and I am like, who am I right now to be down here? I mean, the grass was greener than any green I had ever seen in my life. I know that sounds cheesy but it was so real. It was the old Yankee stadium. Um, every single NBA finals being there for Jordan's final, uh, with the, with final win with the bulls. Um, I don't know, all-star games, you know, part of my job when I worked for the NBA was to be on the court. So to be down there walking around on the court, uh, representing the NBA it was, I don't know. I've loved everything. I really have mostly loved everything that I've done. No, it's, it, it's, um, you look like you are in a state of just pure joy 
And, but I, I, sometimes I wonder if you're, you're putting on a good face, but it's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's, but yes, it seems authentic, especially on television. It always comes through. And it's interesting that you would say that about live TV. Let's bring it back to swimming. Okay. We are down to, we are down to eight minutes. And I just okay. want to, while I have you here and have the summer Sanders wisdom, if you have something that you could share with swim parents who are working with their kids who are, who are, who are moving towards swimming in college, you know, what, what's the, what's the, if you had to sit down on the couch and give them the, the advice, the summer Sanders advice, what is it? Okay. Well, I'm going to give two bits because I thought about this today, coincidentally, um, because I do feel like I've been noticing more pools are opening up now. Um, and let's say, for instance, you're a parent of a 12-year-old, like I have, a 12-year-old son who was into swimming and then now he's not anymore because he's found other sports that he thinks are really fun and all that kind of stuff. Um, my heart is not broken, um, and I'm not broken for him leaving the sport of swimming. But I would like to remind parents that if you are seeing a bit of a shift with your kids, and they're not 100% sure if they want to be in the sport of swimming now because they've had some time away from it, that's okay. I quit three times. I found other things, and I found my way back to it. So let your child create their journey. They have to have the journey. If you push and if you make them feel guilty or anything of the above, it will not work out great. So just let them find their way back to it. Um, so if you have kids now that are elite and moving on to college, uh, I, I mean, first of all, congratulations. And if they're swimming in college, huge congratulations. I think that I, what I loved so much about my swimming career was my college, um, my college experience. I think a lot of professional athletes miss that now and they don't understand what they're missing out on. I mean, they couldn't possibly because they never experienced it, but I'm so incredibly grateful that I had kind of the best of both worlds where I had two years of collegiate swimming at Stanford and then I gave up my eligibility. That's what we called it back then. It wasn't turning pro. We were giving something up. And one week after I gave up my eligibility, I called my dad and said, Dad, do you think the NCA would let me take my decision back? And he said, no, I don't think so. Because Mel, I am a team sport person. I am better. And I love my sport more when I get to share it with people. So I was- Whoa, wait, so wait, wait, wait. You, you, you won eight titles. You guys were, you guys, you were NCAA champions the second year. You wasn't the first year. There was the second year. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. So yeah, I mean, you did it all in two years. Yeah. But then when I gave it up, I was like, I was also, you know, trying to then figure out what's my role. Am I going to make it to Atlanta? What am I going to do? And then, so I went to television. So that, there's your point, right? Like if I, so if you do have a child who's swimming in college, amazing, amazing. Soak it up, be a great teammate. Being a great teammate will make you a better swimmer. Um, more so in college, I think, than on your club team. Five minutes. Okay. I got, sorry. I, I wasn't supposed to say that. That was like, <laughs> um, you turn okay. your, you turn your video off. I'm giving you, I'm giving you time know, cues. You're, you're saying it out loud. How did I'm, you do How did, And you like live television? What, what, what's going on? Can I tell you a funny story about the yes. first, my very first uh, television moment in, in, um, in sports. It was actually my very first television moment. I, I, I worked the NCAA championships in 1993 and they said to me kind of last minute, Oh, you're also going to interview divers network so, CBS, CBS. Yeah. And I CBS and I had an earpiece in, so I had my IFB and in my IFB, they said, ask her if she's pissed. That was what they said. So what did I say? I said, are you pissed? That was, that, um, that wasn't a great performance. Are you pissed? I said exactly <laughs> what they said to me verbatim. And then they said in my ear, you can't say pissed. And I'm like, well, then don't say it in my ear. I was such I, I, a rookie. It was okay, so perfect. I'm going to have 30 seconds. We have a okay. mutual friend, Natalie Coughlin. Natalie, I was, I was calling a meet for, and you, were, you would do the analyst, but you'd also do the interview on deck. Mike yeah. Unger's in the, in the truck. We all know and love Mike Unger. He's, you know, yes. he's, he's the gel for USA Swimming. He's that glue. So the, she's, she's listening as they're talking and we're talking about her and what we're going to ask her because her race wasn't so good. And we hear her come through and say, guys, I'm a human being. <laughs> oh, 
for the and love I, and humanity of the swimmer. Come oh on. My, she, she, she was, she's such a pro. She's so tough. She's so, she's such a great, she's just as a woman's power. And yeah. when she said that, I just felt like my, I felt like my heart was going to just, you know, break in two. But uh, anyway, I, I, I thought you might appreciate that. We are down to three. And this is okay. what I want to, this is what I want to know from you. Uh, so you, you made a, a very flawless transition from being an elite to being someone who works in television and having a successful career as an ambassador and, you know, with, with sponsors. Uh, what's your advice there? Because a lot of elites listen to this. Yeah, I, th- I think the most important thing is to trust the fact that you actually can really be passionate about two things at the same time. So don't wait until the Band-Aid is off with one to then start to go think about the next, right? Um, I think the healthy transition is a slower transition. Be open to learning about new things. Really, everyone said this, but when you, t- when you meet somebody in a field where you think you might have interest, right? A business person that thinks you're awesome, think they're awesome back and grab their card and really follow up with them. Because as much as they love you right now, you will have to work at it to get that job when the time comes. So if you can start to, um, to lay down some foundation there, that's vital. Um, but yes, figure out what your passion is and understand you are never, ever going to find that raw passion that you had with your sport. It is not going to be that easy to find that quickly. It may come around at some point in your career, in your second career. Um, but make sure and try a lot of things. If you don't know exactly what you want to do to weed out the things you definitely don't want to do. It's not going to be perfect. Okay. It's not going to be perfect. The, uh, I think that doing swim swam was in, yeah. in some ways harder than swimming. It was just a grind and a marathon. How, yeah. how does your swimming career compare? I mean, it, it, it to your professional career, your professional life. Is it, it, have you found it to be harder at times? Yeah. I found my professional career to be much harder at times. Um, and the perfect uh, example is that I'm judged right? Like I'm not judged in swimming. Imagine if you thought you swam a great race, you touched the wall first, you better do your time by three seconds, but the judges are like, ah, I didn't really like, I didn't really like you breathing on your side, Mel. We're going to, we're going to mark you down. So now I go into a, a, a career where I, I audition for a show and I'm waiting and waiting to know if I've made the cut. And by making the cut, it's like, did I have the right color hair? Was I the right height? Do they even want a female host? So yeah, you had to build up some thick skin and you didn't really have to do that in your sport. The challenges never end. We are closing down on time. Here's the big question. Yes. Yes. If you come up with the topic you want to talk about, will you come back? Yes. All oh right. my God. I'll always come back. And I don't, you, you, we could just chat about cooking. I don't care. I mean, this is so fun. Yes. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll chat about cooking. What are your dog's names? Uh, the blonde one is Cubby and the brown one is Duke. And Duke is a scaredy cat, and he's older, and Cubby is a little bit um, bossy. She kind of gets in everybody's way, and she's funny. They, they, they work well together. Without dogs, life just isn't worth living. We didn't even get to talk about Spain. You need to bring me back on so I can talk about my year abroad. We'll do it. We'll do it. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.